Gets Real. I am your host, Greg Getz. Now, before I dive into today's topic, I just want to say I hope everyone had a great holiday week last week. I'm sorry I didn't release an episode last week. I took a trip with my family up to Yakuska, Japan, to visit some friends for Thanksgiving. And it was a really, really fun time. So I spent most of my time there with them, and I didn't really want to break away from the little bit of time I had with them to make another episode, so I apologize for my absence, but I am back, and I hope you are excited for this week's episode. Now, we are going to be talking about the American Revolution. Now, some of these things that I'm going to talk about you may already know from your time in school. Those who are in other countries, you most likely don't know about what happened in the American theater, but, you know... It's a fun little topic, especially for the American listeners that I have. Some of these things, like I said, you are going to know from your time in school. Some of these are going to be a little bit new. And some of it might change the perspective or tone of what you may recall from your time spent in school. Because as you can remember from our time in elementary school up to secondary school, high school, you would know that they don't really dive too much into the American Revolution or they don't dive deep, I should say. They don't don't they don't go too deep into what actually happened. Most of it is tailored to making us look like the victims and how we rose up from rose from tyranny and wanted to break out from under the rule of King George and you know, we were we were an oppressed people, but not all of that was the case. Now, I will say some we we did have good cause for breaking away from Britain, okay? I'm, I'm not sitting here saying that we shouldn't have. Like, there were some just causes for why we broke away. Now, should we have gone to the extent? Like, should we have behaved the way that we did? No. And I will get more into that later in the episode. There were some things that the colonists did that I do not personally agree with. And if we were to look at it you know, if it were to happen now and we're looking at it from our own perspective in our own time, then some of it would be like, oh, Jesus, that's a little fucked up. Okay. But we'll get into more of that later. All right. So now we're not going to start right off at the American Revolution. We're going to go a little bit before the American Revolution because a lot of the tension that comes into the American Revolution builds up over years beforehand. So, the ultimate Kickstarter... Now, there were a lot of issues between the American colonists and Great Britain at the time. And what really started to catapult the colonists into wanting to break away from Great Britain was the French and Indian War, or what my European and other listeners might know it as was the Seven Years' War. Because, listen here, American listeners... The French and Indian War did not just happen in the United States. That was just a theater of the Fr- the Seven Years' War, okay? The French and Indian War was just a part of the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War could arguably have been the first world war because there were a lot of countries fighting with each other at this time. So you had France and Britain and the Indians in the United States at or the colonies fighting each other and then in Europe you had Britain France Prussia uh, India you had all these different countries fighting each other and it carried on for a considerable amount of time and a lot of it was power struggles and you know trying to gain the upper hand over the different European powers at the time and one of them was a couple countries wanting to Uh, take down Prussia because Prussia was starting to rise and they were becoming more powerful and Britain and France were not at their highest power but they were they were starting to kind of dwindle down and so you know they wanted to try and secure their place as you know the top dogs that may be something completely different that my European listeners might know they could have learned something completely different i don't know if you have i would love to hear it please fill me in on what you have learned in your countries because that would be 
awesome to hear about, you know, your perspective of the Seven Years' War versus the American perspective, because really all that we are taught in America is the French and Indian War between Brit Britain and the uh, French with the coalition of Amerindian tribes. So tensions rose between the colonists and Britain at the break of the French and Indian War, which started in 1754. Now, how this started was you had the Appalachian Mountains that kind of made a little border between uh, France's colonies and Britain's colonies. And on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains was the Ohio Valley, which was predominantly French, but you also had a group of Amerindian tribes that were settled there. And, you know, there was just some trading back and forth between France and Britain, uh, but most of it belonged to uh, a number of different Amerindian tribes. And, you know, British colonists started kind of going into the valley a little bit more. They started crossing the mountains and they were like, no, we have claim to this land. And France was like, uh, actually, we kind of have more claim. You know, we're allied with these uh, Amerindian tribes here. You guys are not. We're, you know, we're, we're trading with them. So this is more our land. And so there was a constant bickering back and forth between Britain and France. Sorry, I shouldn't say Britain. I should say the British colonists in France about who had the right to the Ohio Valley. So there was a lot of bickering about this area. And what really set the war off was George Washington. Yes, that George Washington. You know who I'm talking about. Open fired on French colonists in Pennsylvania. There was a group of French colonists that were held up in a town called Uniontown. And George Washington was there and, you know, they were kind of like going back and forth with each other. They're just like, no, this is our land. No, this is our land. Well, George Washington says, fuck it. All right. I'm going to I'm going to settle this shit right now. Fire open fired on these French colonists and thus started the war. Britain. Now, obviously, they were going to come to the aid of their colonists in the American colonies, but they they weren't happy about having open warfare. But, you know, they saw this also as an opportunity to gain a larger foothold in North America, while also kind of kicking France out the door, you know, trying to name themselves as the higher power. And then shit just started kicking off in Europe as well, you know. It, it, it's the same thing that what happened in World War One. You know, one person goes to war, and then their allies go to war, their allies go to war, and it's just a whole jumble of shit. So, France and the British colonists start fighting each other. Britain sends over the military to start helping their colonists. Then other countries start jumping into it. So then you had war in India, you had war in France, Prussia, and all these other areas in Europe. And there were even some fights in West Africa as well. So, yeah, it was just a major shit show. <laughs> uh, so, at the beginning of the war, Britain suffered many defeats. The colonists were just... The colonies in Britain were just not having it. You know, France had a lot of Amerindian allies with them. So, I mean, France was just already outnumbered. They did not have a good ally system with Amerindians. So, you know, they were it was just them in the colonies fighting against French and the Amerindians. So, I mean, ugh, you're, you're kind of up Shit's Creek without a paddle at this point. So they suffered many, many defeats at the beginning, and it looked like Britain was actually going to fall and France was going to come out victorious. Well, then there was a gentleman named William Pitt from Britain. He basically came forth to Parliament, and he was just like, Listen, we have a shit show on our hands in the English, in the English colonies, so I'm going to fork up some of my money, and we're going to raise a better army, and we're going to get better arms, and we're going to go over there, and we're going to kick the French's ass. Okay? How does that sound? Parliament was just like, oh, yes, I can call it bully, bully, bully. So, <laughs> I apologize for my British listeners. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just trying to make it a little more fun, you know? Sorry if I'm playing into any stereotypes or if you get offended. My bad. So, 
uh, Parliament was just like, yes, yes, absolutely. No, good, good boy. So William Pitt funded some of the war, and Britain started to turn the tide once he started putting more money into it, and they were able to raise more troops and uh, start pushing French and Indian forces back. Uh, 1763 marked the end of the war in the United States, and then a few months after that, it marked the end of the Seven Years' War in the European theaters with the treaties of Paris and Hubertusburg. Sorry if I mispronounce that. It is it is a little Hugh Burtisberg. There we go. Absolutely beautiful. So 1763, the treaties of Paris in Hugh Burtisberg were signed. Seven Years' War, French and Indian War were resolved. Uh, not much was gained from it. Uh, France did lose, but Britain didn't really move into the colonies or the area that France had lost. France turned a lot of its land over to its ally, Spain. And then the Ohio Valley was kind of just left to the Amer Indian tribes that were there. Britain didn't really want to encroach anymore on their territory. You know, the Seven Years' War, French and Indian War, really, really drove them into so much debt that they could not afford to start encroaching on Native American land even more and thus prompting another war. They just could not handle it. You know, they just did not have the money or anything for it. So they won, yes. France gave up some of its land in the American colonies to its allies, Spain, but Britain did not really move any further. And they made sure that the colonists understood this with the Royal Pro Proclamation of 1763. So remember that little line I told you about, the Appalachian Mountains that kind of divided the French and British colonies? So that was basically reinstated. Britain, or I'm just going to say like the king, you know, I mean, it wasn't really the king, but the king basically said, do not cross this fucking line, okay? Y'all put us in so much debt with your bullshit bickering with France and those Native American tribes, we can't afford another war, okay? So, stay on this side of the line, quit fucking with people, and everything will be fine. Well, the British colonists didn't like that. They were just like, we won this, we won this fucking war, fair and square, all right? You know, we, we're entitled to this land. We won it. It's ours. You know, it, we don't give a damn. And the king was like, oh, Jesus, man, come on. Like, we're in debt. Okay, we had to come over here and save your asses, and now we're suffering with, you know, a huge debt because of all of this shit that you started. So, do us a fucking favor, stay on your side of the Appalachian Mountains, leave the Ohio Valley alone, leave the French alone, leave the Spanish alone, and just, just keep, keep to yourself, okay? Please, keep the peace. So that was the Royal Proclamation of 1763. It forbade British colonists from settling past a certain point into Amerindian lands. Colonists didn't want to hear it. Well, Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, and Thomas Paine, I'm sure some of you recognize those names, they believed Britain was stepping on colonists' freedoms and rights with this proclamation. You know, they believed that since they had won the war and that land was now officially theirs, the, the king had no right to tell them that they could not cross that line. You know, we we fought, we died, that's our right to that land. You can't tell us otherwise, god dang it. Well, I mean, are you really going to argue with the king or are you just going to bicker about it? They basically bickered about it at first. You know, they were just puffing out their chest like, god damn it, this is America before America was even born. Like, that, that's our dang land. Whatever. The king didn't really pay too much attention to it. You know, that's when he sent troops over to the colonies. And basically, like, he didn't set up a physical wall. It was more just, you know, like a abstract wall. You know, it was just like, here, here's where you don't cross. You know, we're going to, we're going to have some couple, uh, some troops stationed around the area. Like, just, just don't go there. Okay, just leave it alone. Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, Thomas Paine hated this idea. They started getting people riled up. You know, they started writing pamphlets and everything. They're just like, they're tramping on our god dang American rats. 
Once the king sent over troops, he created the Quartering Act of 1765, which required colonists to provide housing and food to British soldiers that were stationed in the British colonies. Now, not only did the French and Indian War put Britain into debt, but it crippled the British colonies' economy. It, I mean, it, it, it was like a destitute economy, okay? I mean, so many people were without food. They didn't have any money. It was just a bad time all around. And, you know, obviously, the best way to come out of debt is to raise taxes. And this is something that American education has instilled in our brains when we went to school, is that Britain raised taxes on us just to be dicks about it, you know, in spite, just for no reason. But they had a valid reason. It was because we started a war with France and Indians, and they had to come and bail us out. And then we got pissed when they raised taxes on us. They didn't even raise taxes that high, to be fair. You know, the mainland Britain was taxed like double digit percents due to this war because I mean they were affected really bad with not only having to fight in the British colonies in the in North America but they also had to fight all across the Europe and Africa and India so they were in serious debt at this time so mainland Britain had its taxes like tripled the colonies like the Caribbean and the British colonies in North America, they were not that serious. Like, they, they were maybe, like, I, I, I just want to spitball, like, a number here. I mean, this is not the exact number, but it basically went from, like, 2% to 4% in extra taxes. Now, obviously, that may seem like a dramatic increase, but when you're looking at mainland Britain, whose taxes went from, like, 8% to 23%, that, that's, that ain't shit. So, I mean, yeah, their whole thing wasn't so much the taxes, it was the no taxation without representation. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. That is what basically pissed off the colonists so much, is the fact that they were given these taxes without even being included in the conversation. But still, like, it, it was not that bad. A lot of people had it a lot worse, but you also brought it upon yourself for fucking with France and... Native American tribes, you know, I got, I got off track. Sorry. I started rambling. So the quartering act of 1765 required colonists to house and feed British troops, which created even more of a financial burden on the colonists as they were already suffering from the recent war. They were also, the colonists were also pissed off about the fact that there was a standing army in the British colonies. Like the war was over. This was peacetime. Why is there still an army here? Like, do we need to be babysat? Or, like, what is this? Are you encroaching on us? They, they, it wasn't sitting well with them. Plus, they had to, you know, cough up more food that was supposed to be given to their families to feed these troops. And for what? You know? But a lot of it had to do with the fact that they wanted... That the king wanted to make sure that the colonists were not crossing that abstract line. You know? Like, they didn't, they didn't want the colonists to encroach any further than need be so the standing army was there to not only keep the peace because you know tensions were a little high but it was also to make sure that the colonists stayed in their lane because of the quartering act uh there was a um, naval shipyard in new york that did not want to adhere to this quartering act they were like no we're not giving up our ships. We're not giving up our houses. We're not going to let you fuckers stay here. Like, get the hell out of here. So there was a small skirmish that broke out between colonists and the British Royal Navy and British Army and such. So there was a small skirmish. This only escalated things even more. I mean, the colonists were just basically like, oh, so now you're just going to attack us for no reason? Well, I mean, they kind of had a reason. You were being dicks, but you're right. You're right. No reason other than, you know, being an asshole. So after this small skirmish, the king amended the Quartering Act in 1774, which relieved the financial burden of feeding and housing the troops from the colonists. But it, it, it was a little too late. You know, the colonists were too pissed already 
past this point. And plus, it took so long for the king to amend that that they were like, oh, like now, now you want to fix this after years of us protesting and getting pissed about it? Like, wh why now? You know? So that was amended. And oh, sorry, I, am t I told you the wrong year. It was 1764, not 74. My bad. Also, that very same year, the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765 really sent the colonists into a tizzy. So the Sugar Act placed new taxes on the already hurting colonists. And the one thing that the, the one that really, really pissed them off was the Stamp Act because it hurt everybody. Everybody was affected with it. The the lower class to the higher class because it required anyone who printed anything on any kind of a material to use a special paper that had a stamp on it with an authorized like revenue stamp right and it was only manufactured in london so everyone was affected by this tax and this is when the colonists really started to unite because before you know the main people that were having to house troops and were you know, facing the most burden from it were the lower class people, you know, the people that were struggling already. The aristocrats and stuff, I mean, yeah, they could they could let some people stay in their house and feed them and stuff and not face any kind of financial burden, more just, you know, a burden in general, just like, oh, I don't really like the idea of troops being in my house around my family, but, you know, whatever, we can afford it, you know, we're loyal to the king, and so it didn't really affect them that much. But then you pass the Stamp Act, and this is when the aristocrats, they're just like, okay, I think Thomas Jefferson was right. Something's something's a little fucked up here. Like, I, I can handle people being in my house, but what I cannot handle is getting robbed and having to pay this extra tax when I've been nothing but loyal. Like, it really upset the aristocrats. I mean, they were like, we've been loyal. We helped you. We've been trying to suppress these poor little farmers that have been speaking out against you. And then you turn on us and place this extra tax on us. Oh, how dare you? It's basically where they were coming from. And I'm, I mean, it's, it's fair. It's fair. Kind of. <laughs> so this is when we have the rise of the sons of Liberty the Sons of Liberty was a political organization. It wasn't really so much as a militaristic organization at first. It was kind of just like a boycott organization. You know, they're just like, we need to show up in force. We need to get organized and we need to let the crown and parliament know that we are not going to take these taxes sitting down. So there were a lot of boycotts and pamphlets and uh, public displays of grievances that they went out into towns and, you know, went on the march, basically, and were just protesting. Not fighting, just protesting. And the Sons of Liberty were the first start of it. There were also, this is something that you may not know, there were also the Daughters of Liberty. Greg, I only ever heard about the Sons of the Liberty. Yeah, because sexism is a bitch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, the, the Daughters of Liberty, they didn't really go so much into the political realm because at the time 1700s women still didn't really have as many rights as men so there wasn't as much that they could do but they really took it upon themselves to give the middle finger to great britain by weaving and yarning their own clothes with like their own stuff rather than having to be dependent on british textiles that was their whole thing like look what we can do we don't need you britain we're gonna make our men and boys their own stuff that they don't need from you so basically but yeah i thought that was pretty cool you know growing up i never heard about the daughters of liberty it was only the sons of liberty the daughters of liberty were also a very important group at the time because like i said they weren't the political aspect they were the consumer aspect so the sons of liberty they created this they organized and they created this thing called the declaration of rights and grievances which is where the most famous line no taxation without representation came from basically they got together and they said it's not the taxes that we're pissed off about it's the fact that we didn't get any kind of a say in parliament 
on how these taxes should be handled or like what the numbers should be like are we not british citizens are we not to be included on these things we didn't have anybody go and represent us before parliament to discuss or negotiate any kind of a prices you just place it on us like this is a little fucked up we're supposed to be included on this conversation and that's what really upset the colonists it, it wasn't the taxes it was the fact that they were not included on the conversation they didn't feel like they were british citizens they felt alienated and hurt i mean i don't blame them it, it's fair you know so with that came the townsend acts of 1767 now the purpose of these acts was to raise revenue in the colonies and to pay salaries of governors and judges so that they would be independent of colonial rule because the colonies had their own laws in place and their own jurisdiction and such. The whole point behind the Townsend Acts was Britain trying to impose their rule even more in the colonies so that governors and judges did not have to adhere to colonial rules, but only to British rules. So the colonists couldn't come to them and say, oh, well, that's against our, our town charter or that's against our Bill of Rights. They'd say, no, fuck you. Uh, I work for the king and the parliament, not you, good sir, basically. So this really pissed off the colonists because it's like, so not only are you raising taxes and not including us, but you're also taking the authority that we have over our judges and governors so we can't even get rid of them if they're not doing a good job they they belong to you oh okay fuck you <laughs> and this is what ultimately led to the boston massacre before i jump into that i just need to say this the boston massacre was not the bloodbath that we have been led to believe yes some people died Around five people died. But, growing up, and with the name Massacre, we were led to believe that, you know, dozens of individuals were killed. And that it was British soldiers just shooting into the crowd just because they could. No, that is not what happened. There were a, a couple British soldiers outside of the governor's house in Boston. They were standing guard because there was a mob of angry colonists gathering outside and they were, you know, just protesting, boycotting, yelling, all that shit. And this, this, these, these poor British soldiers, you know, there, so much stuff is being thrown at them. They're being hit with rocks. They're being hit with sticks, snowballs, anything you can think of. They were being hit with, right? And um, they're just standing there taking it. Like the, there was one account from a poor little you know, kid, he had to have been, like, no older than 22, he's just standing out there just getting hit with this shit, and he's scared out of his mind, because, you know, these angry colonists are out there, and, you know, they're, they're angry, and they're pissed off that they're not being represented, and, you know, just, just all the stuff that I've been saying, he called for backup, a couple more soldiers came out, and, you know, they were ordering the crowd to disperse, they didn't listen, so they formed, like, a semicircle in front of the stairs of the governor's house, and they shot into the crowd. Five people died. The crowd dispersed. You know, they dispersed to the outside streets, but they still remained in the area, and they were still shouting and pissed off and angry. And the governor finally, you know, came back to his house, and he uh, went up to the balcony of his house, and he managed to calm the crowd down. But, yes, the, the damage had already been done, unfortunately. And it, it was not like the British soldiers just shot... For the hell of it you know they were being harassed and heckled and former law enforcement speaking here it's not easy <laughs> you know especially when you got people throwing shit at you i i can't say i don't blame them i i don't it's understandable I, I, do i agree with it no but it's completely understandable it's a human response you know you're being abused you you fight back obviously so I, I can understand why they did that. I mean, they were scared. They were defending themselves. Yeah, there's just that. 1773, the Tea Act was imposed. And this 
not only was to help try and alleviate the debt that Britain had uh, occurred over the course of the war, but it was also to help the East India Company, who was greatly affected during the war. You know, war broke out, or fighting broke out in India as well. So the the trading company, I mean, they just got hit bad. They they were they were suffering big time. Plus, colonists they began smuggling when all of these different uh, acts were placed upon them in the colonies as well. So they began smuggling even more. So I mean, the East India Company was hemorrhaging money at this point. So they imposed the Tea Act of 1773. And this led to the infamous Boston Tea Party, when the Sons of Liberty dressed up in Ameri Indian garb and went down to the Boston port and began to dump the boxes of tea into the Boston Harbor. As punishment for the Boston Tea Party, the king imposed the Coercive Acts of 1774, or, as the colonists called them, the Intolerable Acts. It was an attempt to punish the colonists for their protests, and all it did was just piss them off even more. It, it was it was bad. So, I mean, I get where you were coming from, Georgie. You know, you wanted to punish these colonists for what they did, but it did not help. You should have just listened to them, you know? You should have you should have taken their emissaries when you had the chance, and instead, you just throw more fuel on the fire and just piss them off even more. The coercive acts were passed. The first Continental Congress was held in Philadelphia. And they decided there may not be an, any alternative but to go to war. Obviously, they were not prepared. They were severely underarmed. But they thought it was a better, better means of getting out of what they were in versus, you know, just sucking it up and dealing with it you can only be pushed so far before you say enough is enough, right? You, you remember the whole thing where the British sent troops to uh, the colonies or to Boston and Paul Revere rode through the town and was screaming, the British are coming, the British are coming. And that didn't actually happen. That's why they had the lanterns, y'all. one -th by land, two -th by sea. So General Thomas Gage was sent from Britain to the colonies to take over Boston. He and several regiments began going into the city when the lantern was lit in the tower. Paul Revere rode to the Continental Congress, told them what was up, because what would what would the point of him riding through the streets yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming, do? You know, they wanted to covertly prepare for British invasion. They, they didn't want the British to know that they knew, you know, they wanted to try and, you know, build this stuff in secret. They wanted to try and gather arms in secret. They didn't want the British to be aware of whatever they were doing. So why the hell would Paul Revere ride through the streets shouting, We know you're here! We know you're here! No, that doesn't make any sense. That's why they had the fucking lanterns. <laughs> that was that was another stupid myth that we were taught in school. So stupid. <laughs> so yeah. Thomas Gage from Britain arrived in the colonies and he began going through the town raiding and seizing weapons and gunpowder catches that were built up by the colonists because the colonists were preparing for war, which is what the Continental Congress did. They said, we need to prepare. Thomas Gage began finding all of their catches and started seizing it. Boston was under British control. You know, the whole army was there. <laughs> And once they started seizing all of this stuff, this is when the Battle of Lexington and Concord happened. The shot heard around the world. A couple regiments went to these towns. They heard rumors that there were weapon stashes there. And they went to these towns. And it's not clear who started the shooting, but several colonists died. British soldiers died. Thus, the Revolutionary War began. Terrible time. Terrible time. 1775. So, Battle of Lexington and Concord. Shot heard around the world. The war is on. Once colonists got word that 
the militias in Lexington and Concord were killed, bro, <laughs> 20,000 colonists surrounded Boston and fortified Breeds Hill and Bunker Hill. 20,000. They heard that Lexington and Concord suffered defeats. So 20,000, you know, just random people showed up at Boston and they were basically just outside of the town just like, what's up? Here you want to have a fight. You think you can match me in a one-on-one -on -one fight? You know, that kind of shit. So, I mean, if I were Thomas Gage and I look out and I see all that shit, I'd be like, ooh, okay. We've got us a little, uh, Got us a little fight on our hands. All right. While it was an impressive turnout for the colonists with 20,000 20, colonists showing up and fortifying their positions, they did inevitably lose at Breeds Hill and Bunker Hill. But while they did suffer defeat, it sent a message to Britain that they were more of a formidable force than they gave them credit for because... That back during the French and Indian War, okay, Britain sent over their military to take care of France and the Amerindian indian tribes. Colonists showed up, and they were like, hey, we want to enlist. We want to help out. You know, this is our land. We want to fight for it. And the British soldiers didn't want any colonists in their army. They looked down on them. They were like, nah, man, you're just a fucking farmer. I don't want you fighting with me. They looked at the militia like they were dog water you know get shit on your dog water kid that kind of stuff they, they they didn't want any colonists in their army so the fact that these colonists were able to stand toe to toe with the british kind of sent a message but it wasn't so much that they were able to stand toe to toe so they fortified breeds hill britain advanced the colonists retreated to bunker hill they fought some more, and then they retreated and regrouped again for a later combat. But the British suffered so many casualties. I believe they had 200 deaths and 800 wounded. So the fact that the colonists were able to deliver this kind of a blow to arguably the greatest military force in the world at the time... Shit. Okay, maybe we need to take this a little bit seriously. But, you know... He, I, I, I want to believe that Britain didn't want to hurt the colonists that bad because while they were in open rebellion and King George did say that they were in open rebellion and that there was a fight on their hands, they were still British citizens. They were still British colonists. So I don't really think Britain wanted to eradicate them, mainly just suppress them to the point that, you know, they believed that there was a no win situation. I don't know that. That's just the way I would see it. At, after the defeat at Bunker Hill, the Second Continental Congress met and they appointed George Washington to be the commander of the Continental Army. <laughs> now, just imagine this, if you will, okay? You're in the building, you know, you, you're all the colonists representatives are there and you know you're all debating on what you want to do now there was some division in the continental continental congress there were some that did not want to go to war with britain because they knew that it was not going to end well for them so half of them wanted to extend an olive branch to the king and half of them wanted to fight you know they said it's 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 too far we've gone too far now to just back out we need to see this through and, I mean, there were some that they did actually try to extend an olive branch to the king, and the king didn't want anything from it. You know, there was a there was a letter sent to the king, you know, detailing, like, hey, maybe we can sit down and talk this out. The king didn't even want to read it. He was just like, I don't want to fucking see that. They're an open rebellion. This is going to be handled, and it's going to be handled right. So, peace was not an option in the eyes of the king and most of the Continental Congress. So... Sorry, I, I had to, I, I ramble a lot. So just imagine you're sitting there, right? All right, you know, you're just, you're just a guy just sitting there in the chamber. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson gets up and he's like, okay, men, we need a leader. We do not have an organized army, but we need someone who is capable of fighting. Someone who has fought. Someone who knows British tactics. Who can you think of? And you just hear a little... <clears throat> little sound of jingling keys you know just 
Anyone have a suggestion? <coughs> jingle, 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 jingle. Anyone at all? <coughs> jingle, 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 jingle. <sighs> George, do you have something you want to say? <coughs> uh, yes, um... I believe I should lead the uh, Continental Army. As you can see, I have uh, <coughs> a lot of medals on my chest. I don't know if you heard me uh, jingling them a bit. But uh, I have experience fighting, so I, I would like to put my name in for candidacy. Thanks, George. You could have just said that beforehand. That <laughs> that's, that's how I imagine it happened, you know? They're trying to figure this stuff out, trying to figure out who they want to lead their army, and George Washington is just sitting there like a schmuck in full military garb, you know, and he, he doesn't want to come out right and just say that he wants to lead. You know, he wants someone to, to nominate him. So he's sitting there, he's like coughing, and he's jingling his medals, and, you know, just sitting up straight and pompous like, you know, trying to puff out his chest like, hey, look at all my ribbons. I got this... Uh, National Terrorism Medal, and uh, got my uh, Good Conduct Medal, two stars on it, if you don't mind. <laughs> I am ready to fight. So, you know, just looking like a total idiot, but yes, George Washington did end up being named the commander of the Continental Army, and it was not an army. It was a collection of farmers and hunters and it, it, it wasn't it wasn't really an army now here's something i i need to correct how many of you have seen the movie the patriot with mel gibson it came out in the early 2000s so fucking wrong oh my god it is so bad now if you haven't seen the movie mel gibson was a former british soldier who turned into a farmer and gave up the ways of fighting. Well, then he met an unfortunate tragedy within his family, and he was called to fight for the Continental Army. But he formed the militia, and it, the movie portrayed the militia as the backbone of the military. You know, the military was always losing, but the militia was fighting in guerrilla warfare tactics, and they were ambushing the British, and, you know, being very unsportsmanlike, you know, kind of how you would imagine like modern warfare to be with, you know, hiding in a field and ambushing and waiting and uh, espionage and, you know, putting on British soldier uniforms to capture or kill unsuspecting British troops. That That is not how it went down. The militia were basically just spokespersons, okay? They, sure, they did some fighting, but not to the extent that that fucking fairy tale of a movie made. Y'all know the beer Sam Adams? Sam Adams, you know, Boston Lager, Oktoberfest, that kind of shit. Yeah, he makes a, makes a decent beer. Sam Adams was one of the founding fathers of the country. I, I wouldn't really say he was a founding father, but he was a very important figure during the Revolutionary War. So this dude would basically go door to door, you know, just... Uh, hello, ma'am. My name is Sam Adams, and I am a representative of the newly appointed United States of America, and I would like to ask you for your support to join the militia to fight against our tyrannical oppressors, the British Empire. Would you care to donate some money or join our cause? Oh, no, I don't think so. I, I kind of just want to sit this one out. You know, um, my, my husband died during the French and Indian War. I, I kind I just, I really just don't want to be caught up in another war. You know, I'm, I, I, I support you guys, but I, I can't, I can't do anything to support you. Oh no, ma'am. No, absolutely. I completely understand. You know, I had a brother that died at that time too. So I completely understand. Thank you for being so understanding and good luck. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right, boys. She doesn't want to join us. Tar and feather her. That's what they did. If you did not join the militia or show your support for the cause of rebellion and independence, you were treated like a pariah and you were automatically accused of being a, a supporter of the British Empire. Sympathizer. That's the word I'm looking for. Sympathizer. You were accused of being a sympathizer for the British Empire and you were tarred and feathered. How fucked up is that? Now, in the Patriot movie... 
the British were going around and they were gathering townspeople in churches and they were burning the churches with all the townspeople in them. And, you know, they were just you know, burning farms and killing people and blah, 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 blah. That didn't fucking happen because in the end, the colonists were still British citizens. Why would you kill your own taxpayers? Sure, they're an open rebellion. There are going to be some casualties because it is a war, but you're not going to kill everybody. That makes no, absolutely no sense, right? So, The Patriot, while it is cinematically a very good movie, historically inaccurate, horribly awful, plus... Mel Gibson's character was a farmer in South Carolina, and when the British came to his farm, they were like, Oh, all of you slaves are free under British rule. Oh, sir, we're not slaves. We choose to work here. We're like a family. Bitch, please. What? What kind of fucking fairy tale shit is this? I'm sorry. They were slaves. It is an unfortunate business. We choose to live here. No, no, they don't. They didn't choose to live there. They were forced to live there and forced to work the land. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, come on. Some of the things that Hollywood comes up with, man, is just astounding. So, yeah. George Washington was appointed commander. Uh, I don't want to go too far into the war because we all know how it turns out. You know, there were a few battles and we got the French to join our side in the end. And we beat the British, declared our independence, blah, 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 blah. We, we know how it ends. Um, one thing I will say, though, <laughs> it is the British colonists slash the United States of America, it is their fault that the French Revolution occurred and that uh, King Philip and Marie Antoinette were beheaded. It is our fault because the Seven Years' War drove them into debt the they were just hemorrhaging and hurting really bad but then we approached them and they were we were like hey if you join us we will set up an exclusive trade deal with you and you can come over here we can give you our goods you give us some of your goods and we'll we'll, we'll set up this juicy little trade deal with you and you can help us beat the british your longtime enemies king philip was like well fuck i'm not gonna turn that down Everyone in his court were just like, this is a terrible idea. We don't have the money to do this. What the fuck is your problem? He's like, but we can be Britain. They were like, at what fucking cost, dude? We don't have the money. Your people already hate you. Oh, they can't hate me anymore. Well, they came over. They helped us. It sent them into so much debt. And the United States jipped them out of their trade deal that the French Revolution occurred, Marie Antoinette and King Philip were beheaded, and the monarchy of France was taken down because of the United States. So, USA, USA, just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's terrible, terrible stuff. But, yeah. Um, now, there was another suggestion after we won our independence. So the Continental Congress came together and they were like, we need to form a government. What kind of government should we do? We need a document that displays our government and how it needs to be handled. The Constitution was not the first one. It was, it was the second draft. The first draft was called the Articles of Confederation. This is something that really makes me mad because it was a very good idea. Very good idea. The Articles of Confederation made the federal government very small, limited power, and the states had like all the power. You know, you the United States it was it was all you know one country, but each state government was in control of its own state. The federal government was only there for going to war and like trade. And stuff like that. It, that, that. That was it. That was the only reason that the federal government would be involved. They didn't have their hand in everything. It came down to the states and the people. Because, I mean, that's what the whole war for independence was all about. It was about breaking away from British rule and creating a country that you could be yourself and, like, the people could be as one. 
You know, they promised women that they would be treated as equal citizens. They promised to set the slaves free and treat them as equal citizens. But then once the war ended, they said, women, get back into the kitchen. Slaves, get back to work. This is a white man's country. And it is the unfortunate truth. I'm not trying to be on a soapbox, but it's what happened. You know, we, we promised these people their equal share, and that's why they helped us. But then once our once their job was done, we told them to stay in their lane. It's the unfortunate truth. But the Articles of Confederation limited the power of the federal government and placed the power into the hands of the people. But there were some members who said that this was a terrible idea because the people, as in everybody, the cons like the whole group were inherently stupid and they could not behave in a rational manner and they could not handle that kind of power properly so it had to be placed in a select few the articles of confederation survived for like maybe a year or two where the states had their power and the federal government was just like that then the constitution was made now while i do like the constitution it is a very nice document it is terrible compared to the articles of confederation because then it gave all the power to the federal government and the states had limited control everything came down to the federal government and the states were just eh, they were just there you know because they believed that the people could not handle that responsibility and they may be right you know it, it, it's kind of like what tommy lee jones said in men in black a person is sane, a person is reasonable, but people are erratic, irrational, and they scare easily. So, I mean, it, it's understandable to believe that the majority could not handle something like that, so it had to fall upon the select few. The problem is, the select few were the ones that promised certain groups that they would be treated equally, but then kibosh the whole thing. And they just wanted to take control and take power. It was, it was basically just wealthy landowners that were just like, oh, no, the people are stupid. We need to be in control because we know how things work. That That's basically how it went. Yeah, that is all I have on the American Revolution. I know I didn't really talk too much about the revolution itself. Uh, it's, it, it's fun to talk about, but I, I, I think the precursor to the American Revolution is something that has not been talked about in American education, and I think it needs to be talked about. You know, it wasn't so much that we rose up against a tyrannical government. It was basically we had a hissy fit because we didn't get our way, and Britain told us to stay in our lane, and we didn't like that because we're fucking Americans, you know? That's, that's basically how it went. And it, it kind of just spiraled out of control. You know, the king didn't want to give in to the demands of a bunch of little farmers and the farmers were pissed off that they were not included on the big boy talk you know they were they were little kids that weren't invited to the big to the grown-up table basically it, it was we we won because of the french let's just leave it at that we we won because of the french we would have lost without the french <laughs> So yeah, that was the American Revolution. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I enjoy talking about it. Uh, this is this is you know it's a fun topic. I, I enjoy reading about it and I enjoy talking about it. I love giving different perspectives, especially the whole George Washington jingling his medals to get recognition. Uh, that it's it's really fun to talk about that. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, I am going to continue to be more active now that the holiday is over. Just prepare yourself for when Christmas and New Year's comes around. I will not be, uh, I will not put out episodes that week because you know it's a time for family and such. To my Jewish listeners, Happy Hanukkah! I know Hanukkah just started recently, so Happy Hanukkah! And to everyone else, thank you for joining me. Please make sure you, I, please leave a review, like, subscribe. Uh, send some love my way on reviews and subscriptions and such. I would really appreciate it. Thank you for coming back, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you, and have a great night.